Good morning. Good morning. We're glad you're here. I hope you survived the storms of last night, and uh, we're glad you're here for worship. Remind you of just a couple of things. Uh, this week of Holy Week, just to remind you that uh, this, sat- this Friday night uh, is our Good Friday service at 6 o'clock, and we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, so I hope you can join us on Friday evening for that. And then on Saturday will be our Easter egg hunt for our children. That'll be from 1030 to 12. And then we'll have lunch following that with hot dogs and chips afterwards. And if you're planning on coming or your family's planning on coming, please let the church office know just so we can plan accordingly. So hope you'll remember those two things this week. Let's pray as we begin our time of worship. Father, it's good to be in your house this morning, Lord, to come and worship, to fellowship, uh, Lord, to study your word. Uh, We thank you for all the the many, many blessings, Lord, that you've given us as as individuals, as a church family. Um, Lord, we pray that you'll just continue to um, to guide us and lead us in all that we do. We pray for this special week on the Christian calendar, Lord, but may it not just be a a week that we observe, but Lord, every day, every every week of the year, may we be reflecting on what you have done for us, of the sacrifice that you made, of the life that you live, but Lord, for the your, your, resur- your, your death and your burial and your resurrection, Lord, of all that took place so that we could have life and we could have it eternally. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, this season, and may we reflect on that every day. May we worship you today uh, with all of our heart and soul and mind, and may we take the things that we hear, the things that we learn, uh, may, it, may, it, may it prick our hearts so that, Lord, we go out and live a life that will be pleasing to you, but, Lord, will lead others to know you as well. Uh, Lord, guide us through this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Would you all please stand and sing with us? It 
was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day sorrows lamb of god by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of god has been on jesus head. silent as he stood accused Beaten, mocked, and scorned Bowing to the Father's will He took a crown of thorns And oh, that rugged cross My salvation Where your love poured out over cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee sent of heaven God's own son to purchase and the very ones who nailed him to that tree oh that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah Praise and honor unto Thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Oh, that rock. 
rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee, praise and honor unto thee. And honor unto thee. Y'all may be seated as the children come. Good morning. Good to have y'all here this morning. I tell you what, I observe a lot when I'm worshiping. And I look down here at these front row Baptists right here. And these guys, you can feel the Holy Spirit in them. It, it excites me to see you worship. I want some of that, Brother Hal. <laughs> Give me some of that stuff. Amen? Well, if you were in the Lord's house this morning, and you're glad to be here this morning, say amen, and wink at somebody, or throw them an elbow, or bump them there, just a second, let's get acquainted, just a second this morning, won't take but a minute, you ain't got to go across the aisle, give us a smile, throw a smile across there to somebody, will that work, a good smile, some of them, you know, God had a sense of humor, if you don't believe it, look to the left and right of you, and see if you don't smile, <laughs> well, let me tell you something, kids, i got to ask you a question. Have you got a busy week in store for you this week? Is your week busy? You doing anything in particular? Mm -mm. This guy made Facebook history yesterday as he took a hard ball to the head, and we can still see the imprint of it right there. He's going to be a future dog, right? <laughs> no, no way. How many of you have got a busy week planned already? You may have an appointment book or you may look on your, your phones and you find out, I've got a busy week. My Sunday school class gets a regular lesson about this time every year. And the lesson before Easter Sunday is entitled, It's a Busy Week. Just by chance, I have Jesus's, a copy of Jesus' appointment book for this week. It's full. It's filled with things that took place in Jesus' life this week. Can I tell you a few of the things that's going on in Jesus' life this week from his original appointment book? Jesus said, let me gather together with my disciples and let's have a meal together. They called it the Last Supper. Jesus found betrayal and denial among those that called him his disciples and loved him dearly. Jesus says, let me go to the Garden of Gethsemane and have time to be with my Father in prayer. And there he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and sweated to the point of blood and to encounter the Roman soldiers that took him to trial. He looks around for his disciples after this takes place and they've all flown, they're fleeing, flown. they went away, that's what they did. Where are they? We even have one that said, Jesus, I'll never deny you. Hey, man, don't say that. By the time the rooster crows three times, you'll say that you never knew me. It was a busy week. A busy week. He goes before Pilate, and Pilate says, What are you doing here? I find no guilt among you. But the people outside are hollering, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It's a busy week. Is your week this busy? It gets busier and busier and things get worse and worse, but they get better. He carries his own cross to a place they call the hill of Golgotha. To the point of physical exhaustion. Simeon reaches over and carries the cross the remainder of the way. 
It's a busy week. As he gets to the foot of the cross, he sees the Roman soldiers there preparing to nail him to the cross. It's busy. As they nail him to the cross and as they raise him up, he looks to his left and his right and he sees two thieves that have been convicted. And even on the cross in the excruciating pain that he's in, there's conversation. There's witnessing. There's still an opportunity to share the word that Jesus has to share. As he says to the one, the one, decide, the one on the cross says, Jesus, remember me in heaven. Jesus says, it will be done. The one on the other side, if you're the king of the Jews, then take us down from here and spare our lives. It's a busy week. The anguish and the pain of Jesus at this time is unbearable. He's thirsty. He's been beaten. He's been flogged. He's been denied. He's been betrayed. But it was all in the appointed book that was written in heaven by the Heavenly Father. My son, you've got things to do. Father, if it be my will... Be thy will. Take this cup from me. You see, he was human too. He experienced the pain in human form, what he was going through. But he knew that he had to hang on that cross. And when he hung on that cross, he was thinking of you. But it gets better. For the busy week gets better. As he took his last breath, he says, It is finished. And to the tomb that he goes, an unbar a borrowed tomb. And as I told the class this morning, what do you do when you borrow something? What do you normally do after you borrow it? Who said that? You give it back. You see? He didn't have any need for that tomb. He wasn't going to stay there long. He had places to go and people to see because it was a busy week. And one of the first persons he encountered was Satan himself. And he said, Satan... I've overcome death. This grave, this grave, this grave can't hold me. Amen? And as he arose on that third day, mom comes looking for him, but she can't find him. The stone's gone. The Roman soldiers are afraid for their life. It's a busy week for everybody. None of this was planned on earth, but it was planned here in the appointment book of life. And then as he encounters those that were closest to him, some of them even said, I don't believe that's you, Jesus. Even they used the word, I don't believe that's you, Jesus. Oh, doubting Thomas, look at these hands. Are these not the imprints of the nails? Mm, you got me there. And the last thing that he said as he was talking to some 500 people during the course of that time, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. It's a busy week. And we know that Jesus overcame death and he overcame the tomb. And it's a wonderful week, even though some of the things that are written in Scripture show the pain and the horror in the death of Jesus Christ. But he lives. Amen? He lives. And as he was looking down upon the cross, he said, Mama, Roman soldiers, you better know that you know that you know that I'm your Lord and Savior. He said that. That's right here. You better know. You better know for certain. Because I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back. And he's coming back. And all God's people said, Most gracious Heavenly Father, the perfect plan of salvation, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the ultimate price that he paid for us on Calvary's cross. We can't thank you enough. We can't buy our salvation. We can't earn it. 
but it's given to us freely. Simply by knowing that we know that we know that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Thank you for your son. And may we take this week to heart and realize what Jesus' appointment book was really like. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Have a good week. y'all stand and worship with us this morning.
thank you all for, for that this morning. What a great time of worship. And uh, let me just emphasize uh, something that Tom said earlier about our Good Friday service. I hope you'll be here for that celebration. Uh, we're going to have a good time on that Friday night at 6 o'clock. And then next Sunday morning, the, um, we will worship early service and late service. But in the late service, uh, the choir will have a, a bigger role in, in the leading of us, our worship. And uh, so I'm looking forward to, to that together on Easter Sunday morning. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 19. If you were in Sunday school this morning, at least in our class, this was the, the passage that, part of the passage that we focused on this morning. Mr. Bill, thank you for um, giving us that, that, uh, that um, itinerary, that, ex- that ex- listing of what Jesus did on that on that very busy week. This is Holy Week, as it's called, the last week before Jesus' death and resurrection. And and one thing I'd like to say before I read this passage, it, it's easy to to look at all the events of what took place and and to see see it as if Jesus was a victim of just this confusion and this mob and ultimately ending his life. But I think it is imperative that we understand that this was not a script that man was carrying out against Jesus. This was the plan of the Father that fulfilled prophecy and that was to accomplish for humanity what humanity could not accomplish for themselves. And so that makes it significant, right? And and so when you think about, about just how all of this fulfilled what God had planned and motivated by his love, you can't help but but look at it and say, man, what what an important, important event. And so you're in John chapter 19. Today we want to read, we want to read John's account of what happened on that day that Jesus was crucified and then buried and then ultimately his, uh, his resurrection. I want to begin in verse 16 and I'm going to read through chapter 20, verse 18. You follow along. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It is written, Jesus, the Nazarene the king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest and the, of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts a part for every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. For for from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. 
But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about a pound, hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as, they had yet, as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus and Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Can you imagine? <laughs> I just cannot imagine the excitement that must have been in what she experienced and seeing him and then running to tell and to make that, to make that known to others. So for the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at uh, the gospel accounts, and I have thoroughly enjoyed, even though they're long passages, I have thoroughly enjoyed our reading together, uh, these accounts from the Gospels uh, about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And what we have found as we have looked at them is that each of them has given us in pretty much the same, but in some variations, the details about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They basically tell us what happened. Well, as we have explored them, we have gone beyond what we find in the Gospel and we have read in other passages, and our, and our purpose in all of this was, was not just to see what happened, but to see why it happened. And what I have shared with you is that as you, as you examine, you look at the what happened, and then you look in, in the letters that, in the rest of the New Testament, and you see where, where they give insight into why it happened. And, and as I look at those, there, there are three things that, that I have shared with you uh, that, that give us insight as to what was accomplished through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And one of those things that I said is, is that it makes possible something. In fact, three things I identified. It makes possible that the forgiveness of the penalty of our sin, it's possible. It makes possible freedom from the power of sin. And it makes possible hope 
for now and in the future. And so when you put all of that together, what I'm saying is, is that through Jesus' death and resurrection, that it accomplished for us these things. Well, we've looked at the first one, and today I want us to focus our attention on the second one. I want you to turn in your Bible, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. And we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time there in, in, uh, in what we're looking at. But I want to make that statement again. It's not really just a statement that I've come up with to have a sermon idea. It was a part of three points in the original message that, that the significance of the death and the resurrection of Jesus is there because it's mentioned in the prophecy. It was motivated by God's great love for humanity. And then the significance is seen in these three things that are made possible by the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so I want you to hear the second one again. The death and the resurrection of Jesus makes possible freedom from sin's power. And so that is a theological truth. That is a biblical truth. And so when I look at that, just, just on the surface, looking at what I just, that statement that I just gave to you, when you look at that, I, I want to show you that there are, that there are three parts of this, three aspects of this that teach us what that means, that the death and the resurrection of Jesus makes possible the freedom from sin's power. And so the first, the first of these, this statement, what it shows to us is, is that it implies, it implies that there was a point that we were not free, okay? So if he says, if I'm saying, and, and I understand that the heart of Scripture, talking about the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that through His death and resurrection, one of the things that God accomplished is that He brought about the freedom from sin's power in our lives. That would imply that at a point prior to salvation, we were not free, right? And so, and again, that's not something that, that I have thought up. In fact, look at in Romans chapter 6, look at verse 6. We're going to look at the first 14 verses this morning, but, but I just want you to see verse 6. So Paul says this, Romans 6, 6, he says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with. And then notice this last line. The New American Standard translation is what I'm reading from, and this is how the, the translators did this. They said, so that, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. And so what's implied in that is that if I'm no longer to be a slave, then prior to whatever that point in time that I'm now no longer a slave, the point is that prior to that, I was a slave. And so that's the, that's the clear teaching, not just here, but in other places, that that's what characterized you and me. That we were, we were under, in somehow, some way, we were under the power of sin. Sin reigned, ruled. We were enslaved to it. And in salvation, part of what God did through death and resurrection of Jesus is that He broke the power of sin and therefore He freed us from sin's power. Well, let me show you some additional verses that just point this fact out that before we were saved, that we were enslaved to sin. Jesus said, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to give you the references. John 8, 34, this is the passage where... In uh, earlier, Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. You familiar with that? After verse 34 that I'm fixing to quote to you, in verse 36, I believe it is, he said, and if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. You're really free. Well, in verse 34, Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Okay? So if you take Romans 3.23 that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 9 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. And so the reality is, is that all of humanity, for all time, every person is a sinner. Everyone has sinned, right? You agree with that? And so because we all have sinned, what was characteristic of us was then that we were the slave of sin. Now, I believe it's in the same context in John chapter 8 that the religious leader said to Jesus, we are Abraham's offspring. We have never been a slave to anyone. Well, Jesus says, yeah, but you were a slave to sin. 
Because everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We are enslaved. We are bound. We are in bondage to sin. Titus, Paul wrote in, the, in Titus, he said in Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, he says that before salvation, we were slaves to various lusts and desires. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to see how Paul, what Paul writes in this passage about what was true of us before we were saved. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. What I'm about to read to you is true of everyone before they come to faith in Christ. This is, this is where we were. If you're saved now, this is where you were. If you're not a believer, you've not believed in Jesus and been born again, this is where you are according to the Word of God. And so chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Well, how do I know that? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All who have sinned, according to Ephesians 2, 1, are dead in their trespasses and sin. Look at verse 2. In which, in that deadness of, in our trespasses and sin... You formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And that is a reference to Satan and his activity and what he is doing in the life of an individual who is not saved, who has never been born again. This is what's true of them. Dead in their sins, living according to the course of this world, the ways of this world, in their sin... And working in them is the God of this world, Satan, the prince of the power of air. He is at work in the sons of disobedience, which is who all of us, that's what all of us were before salvation. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And so, just get in your mind, this, what he's describing is what is true of an individual before they are saved, enslaved to sin. In fact, in, in Colossians chapter 1, and verse 13 and 14, Paul said that when we, were, when we were saved, we were rescued from the domain and the authority of Satan. And we were transferred from that place to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, that is the forgiveness of our sins. And so, if that's what transpired when we were born again, then it tells me that before salvation, I'm in a place where my life is under the authority of Satan, His dominion, His rule, and sin I am enslaved to, as is true of every one of us. Now, you may say, but wait a minute, I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. Did you notice that when I read Ephesians 2, Paul said, and we all formally lived among this, like this. And Paul, who, was, who by his own words said, when it came to the law, I was just when it came to the law, the keeping of it, he said, you didn't find anybody that was better than me. And yet Paul said, I am the chief of all sinners. And so it doesn't matter whether you in your mind are saying, well, I hadn't done anything really bad. Everybody has sinned, all of us. And whoever sins is a slave of sin. Now, if I said amen and we went home right now, that this be the most depressing message that you had ever heard in your life. Because that is a, it is a bondage, it is an enslavement that you and I cannot do anything in and of ourselves to free ourselves from. You cannot get out of that bondage in and of yourself. No way. Well, that's where the good news of the gospel comes in. Because what God did through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, He made it possible for you and me to be free from sin's power in our lives. So... It implies that statement, the death and resurrection of Jesus, makes possible freedom from sin's power, implies that at some point we were enslaved. We were not free. Second point is this. That statement, that the death and the resurrection of Jesus makes possible freedom from sin's power, indicates how God does it. 
how God sets us free. So it is because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And something that God did, what God accomplished through Jesus' death and resurrection makes it possible for us to have freedom from sin's power. So go back to Romans, if you will, chapter 6. And I want to show you some things. So look at verse 1. Start in verse 1. So I'm showing you how we set, are set free. What God did through His Son Jesus to bring about our freedom. Romans 6, verse 1. Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. God forbid. And then he makes this statement asking a question really. He says, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, he's going to explain what it means to have died to sin in the rest of these verses, but he's simply asking a question. In fact, everything that will follow in verse 3 through 11 is Paul really responding to this concept. How is it possible that an individual who has experienced salvation, how is it possible that they would continue in sin? And I think I know that Paul's reasoning is you don't have to that you have been given freedom from sin's power in your life as a believer, and you are not under obligation to live according to sin, for sin to be master and Lord in your life. You have been set free. And so Paul's like, how can you even say that? How, how do you even, don't you know, he'll say in just a minute, don't you realize exactly what's happened in you when you were born again? So look at verse 3 as he begins to give an answer to this. He says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. And so what Paul is saying is, when you were saved... Something happened in your life so that now what characterizes you and me is that we are walking in newness of life and we're not walking like he described in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And that something that happened in our salvation is, is related to what God did through Jesus when he died on the cross. Look at verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Now stop there for just a minute. So Paul has introduced this whole concept of baptism. Does he mean water baptism? I think he's alluding to water baptism, but that's not his main point. Water baptism is a picture of what happened in your life, if you're a believer, of what happened in your life when you believed in Jesus and were saved. The Bible says that in that moment that you believed, that you acknowledged your sin and you called upon the name of the Lord to save you, and God forgave you for the penalty of judgment due your sin, and you're forgiven, that at that moment that you are born again, you are in some way, according to Paul, you are baptized into Christ. The Bible uses another place that says that at salvation that Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. In fact, one of Paul's favorite phrases in his letters is, in Christ. And in his mind, what he understood was that at the moment of salvation, that there is this union. In fact, he says it in verse 5, that we have been united with Him. And in fact, the, the verb there in the Greek is a perfect tense verb, which means at salvation you were united and you continue to be united. Nothing's going to change that. And in his mind, and Paul's using baptism as this picture, that there is this identification with his death. Here's what it looks like. He was crucified. We're crucified. He's buried. We're buried. He was raised again. We are raised again to walk in newness of life. And Paul is, is understanding that everything that happened to Jesus was just as if Paul, it was happening to Paul. His death, burial, and resurrection. 
And by faith, Paul is saying, when I believed in Jesus, my life is so identified with God, with Christ, in Christ, that when God looks at me, my, his death and my death, it's almost as it is as if I died. Because the death of Jesus is accepted as your death. He paid your penalty. He took the judgment for you and your life is in him. And when he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he rose again, you rose again. And that is that identification happens at the moment that we believe and we trust Jesus. And the only way that sin's power can be broken is that a death happens. Look at verse 6. He says, knowing this, knowing what God did in your salvation with your identification with Jesus, knowing this, our old self was crucified with him that our body of sin might be done away with. The word there has the idea to be rendered ineffective, inoperative, to have no power, that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. I was, I was having dinner with someone last night, and, and I said, man, I just wish Paul, I wish Paul would just be, you know, he understood his analogies. I don't always grasp them. And I just need to spend more time just saying, God, open my eyes, help me see and understand. And, but I'm, I'm in good company. Peter said in his letter, there's a lot of things Paul wrote that's just hard to understand. So I'm glad he said that. I don't have to understand it all. What I'm saying is, according to what I read here, that the moment when Jesus died and I believed in him resulting in my salvation, somehow, some way, God, in the work of salvation, my life is now identified with Christ in Christ. And everything that's true of him is now true of me. Does that make sense? And that identification is the very reason that sin is broken. The only way for sin to be forgiven and broken is that death happens. In fact... Look at verse 7. He who has died is freed from sin. Only as death happens is there freedom from sin. And the death, it's, it's this association, it's this identification, it's that by faith when we are saved, we are united with Him in His death, His burial, His resurrection. And the result of that is, is that sin no longer has any, has any power over us. That's true. I mean, that's the fact. That's what he said right here. In fact, in verse 7, when he said that for he who has died is freed from sin, the word freed is a perfect tense verb, which means it happened here, and the results continue indefinitely. And that means that if you have believed in Jesus and been born again, hearing me right now, it means that you are free. It means that freedom is what is true in your life. Let me show you. Let me show you some other verses. I'm just going to give them references. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You, the phrase, have been crucified, is a, pre, is a perfect tense verb in the Greek, which means it happened and it continues. Meaning that my... To me, for Paul to say that, I have been crucified with Christ. He's like, that's who I am. I'm a dead man. I have, I have died. My life is associated with Christ, and the power of sin is no longer controlling me. Do you realize, do you realize that, that when a person dies, whatever they struggled with no longer has power over them, right? I mean, when you cease to exist... Doesn't matter what may have been a struggle in your life, you no longer struggle with it because you have died. That's what Paul is saying. In Christ, I have died. Sin no longer has any power over me. Why? I'm dead. It has no power. It doesn't have to have any power. It doesn't, it's no longer ruling in our lives. We are no longer the slave of sin. And what that amounts to is, is that because I know we still face temptation and we struggle and we all face sin, but here's the deal. You do not have to sin, period. Before you were saved, all you had, you were the slave of sin. You were going to sin, period. It was controlling. You were under its rule and reign. Now that you're saved, power of sin is broken. You'll face temptation, 
but you do not have to sin because you have been set free. And that is a, that is a gospel truth. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. What happened to old things? Passed away. What has come? New things have come. In the original language, that phrase, new things have come, perfect tense. They've come and they continue to be. It is describing a state of being. I have been and continue to be united with Christ. I have been set free and I continue to be set free. I have been crucified with Christ. I continue to be crucified with Christ. I have become a new creation in Christ. I continue. That newness continues in our lives because that is how thorough the salvation is that God gives to us. Let me go back to Ephesians really fast. Ephesians 2 again. Verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, what did God do? He made us alive. He made us alive together with Christ. And then he makes this statement, By grace you have been, what? Saved. Verse 8, By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, so that no man boast. It is a gift of God. That phrase, have been saved, guess what? Perfect tense. Happen continues indefinitely. Man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you grasp what God has done through Christ, when He saved you and me, He not only took care of the penalty that was due your sin and forgave it, but the very power of sin that had control over your life, over my life, He has broken that. He has freed you from it. And now you can walk and live in newness of life. And that is, that is the power. That's the significance. That's why Easter ought to be a celebration because of everything that God has done for us. So, this statement that the death and resurrection of Jesus makes possible freedom from sin's power, it, it implies that we were once bound. It indicates how God brought it about. And then the third thing is, it is an invitation to me, to us, to live in the freedom that is ours in Christ. Look back in Romans chapter, chapter 6, and I'll conclude with this. Beginning in verse 11. I, I, you, let me say this first. I used this illustration this morning with the early service. If, if, you were, if we were in prison, chained and locked up in prison, and then someone came and set us free, took the chains off, opened the door, what are you going to do? You're going to get up, and you're going to walk out of that prison, right? And you're going to live free from what bound you. And the same is true spiritually. Because of what God did through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, it means that the power of sin has been broken in our lives. That implies to me, I mean the natural conclusion then, is that I will now live in the freedom that is mine in Christ. How do I do that? Well, look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Given everything that he has just said, in verse 11 he said, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word consider, as my translation has it, is the word reckon. It, it's an accounting term that means add it all up. And you will come to this conclusion. This is the answer you will get when you add it all up. Do not reckon this to be so, that you are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is a fact. It's not a suggestion. It's not a maybe. It is a fact, a theological truth. Sin, dead to sin, and alive to God. Look at verse 12. That, is, that verse 11, is you need to consider this. If you're going to live in the freedom that is yours in Christ, then he says, consider this. Look at verse 12. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. That is a command to us. Why is it possible? Because the power of sin has been broken in our lives. 
And therefore, he says, you and I have the choice. Before salvation, all we had was we're in bondage to sin. Now we're set free. Now, every time that we are faced with a temptation, we have the choice and we can make the choice. Am I going to yield to the temptation and sin? Or am I going to yield to God and present myself as an instrument of righteousness to God? And I can because the power of sin has been broken. I'm not obligated here. Romans 8, 12, Paul said, we do not, we're obligated but not to the flesh to live according to it. And God has wrought such a transformation in our lives. We don't have to live here. And so he says, don't let it happen. That's just a choice, a decision that we, that we make within our, within our lives. Second thing he says in verse 13, he says, Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, present you, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. The word present has the idea of yield or to submit to. It's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 in verse 1 where he said, By the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices unto God. And what I'm saying is, Paul's point is, because you have been set free from the power of sin in your life, your response is now, you can take the members of your body. I mean, let's just be honest. The sin, sin is carried out in our body, isn't it? Our thoughts, our words, our eyes, our minds, the members of our body. That sin manifests itself through the members of our body. And so when sin appeals to you in the temptation, it's something to do with you and your body. And Paul says, stop presenting yourself and yielding yourself to sin, to be an instrument of sin, but rather present yourself to God. And again, I will say, you can do it because God, through Christ, has broken the power of sin in your life. And now you can yield yourself to God. You say, well, that sounds, that sounds easier said than done. I understand that. And so God gave us the power to do it, and that is the person of His Spirit who dwells within us. Galatians 5.16 says that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not carry out the desires of our sinful nature. And so God has equipped us and given us what we need so that we are able to stand firm and resist and present ourselves to God and not present ourselves to sin and to Satan. We can choose then. I'm not going to let sin reign in my mortal body. And then look at the last thing in verse 14. He said, sin shall not be master over you. Why? You're not under the law, but under grace. You know what that means? I interpret under grace to be kind of a catchphrase to say everything that God did out of His great love and grace through His Son Jesus to literally break the power of sin in our lives. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. I've been set free. Sin shall not be master over your life. And can I tell you something? If you're a believer, and it is right now, it's only because you're giving it the control in your life. It's not because you have to. You choose to. Because you don't have to. I don't have to. You say, well, you don't know what I struggle with. I don't have to know what you struggle with. I don't have to know how sin manifests itself in your life. It doesn't matter. His death and resurrection broke the power of every sin of sin has no power over your life. Two questions. One, have you been set free? Some of you in this room, some of this, you in this room have never believed in Jesus and been born again. And so you've never had, the, you've never had your sin forgiven, the penalty of your sin removed, and the power of sin still over your life. And, and for some of you, you may be trying really, really hard by being good and religious and all those kind of things. But if you've never, there is only one way to have your sin forgiven and the power broken, and that's through Jesus and faith in Him. There's no other way. None. Acts 4 says there's salvation in nobody else, nowhere else but the name of Jesus. And so my question is have you been set free? Have you, been, have you believed in Jesus and been born? Again, 
And if you've not, today you can. Call upon the name of the Lord as you acknowledge your own sin before God. And you turn from it to Him in faith. God says, whoever calls on His name shall be saved. And you know what happens? When you call on His name, He takes the penalty of your sin and He writes, paid in full. The debt is gone. The penalty has gone. None. And I think God gets the greatest delight, not just that, but then He takes the power of sin and like snaps it. And this is my child, and sin no longer has any. You are no longer under the authority of darkness and sin and Satan. God has transferred you to the kingdom of His Son. So if you've never been born again, I invite you today to believe in Jesus and be saved. Many of you in this room have already believed. And the reality is that you are free. My second question is this. Are you living in freedom that's already yours in Christ? Some of you still hanging out in the cell, holding on to the chains. They're free. You're free. But you're still just hanging out, holding on to the chains, and you hadn't stepped out to begin living in the freedom that is yours, that is brought about in you by the very powerful Holy Spirit of God who dwells within you. Start today. Start today. And maybe what that looks like is just you confessing to God that you have been under the rule of sin in your life. And your desire today is to start living in the freedom that's already yours in Christ. Let's, let's pray. God, I thank you for I thank you for your truth. I pray you help us to accept it by faith and believe it. I pray, God, that you take your word that we've heard a lot of this morning and you filter it out of my words and you help us hear what you're saying. And may we obediently respond to you and follow you today. Lord, I thank you for your amazing grace. Your amazing grace and love to not just forgive us, but Lord, to set us free. And I thank you for the testimony of your word that if the Son sets us free, we're free. Sin no longer has dominion over us. We are no longer the slave of sin. God, may we, may we reject the lies that Satan would throw at us even right now saying, yeah, you're hearing that, but it'll never be true. May we reject that and by faith stand on the truth. And I pray you set people free today. I pray, pray for those that are in this room that have never believed, that they'll call upon the name of the Lord. And God, that they will believe and be forgiven and freed and saved today. May they do that even right now. And I pray for believers in this room that are already free but not living free. I pray that you'll take your word and penetrate our hearts today. And Lord, that we will take whatever action needs to happen right now to stop presenting ourselves as instruments of sin and unrighteousness and start presenting ourselves to you and walking in this freedom that is already ours in Jesus. And so I pray you work in each of our hearts today, God. And Lord, that we would hear and respond in obedience as you lead us. And be glorified, God, in all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. You respond to the Lord as he leads you this morning.